bone health is becoming more and more of an issue for the urologist in terms of providing optimal bone health care primarily for the prostate cancer patient, but also those men with low testosterone or hypogonadism. It's been long recognized that significant loss of bone mineral density occurs in the prostate cancer patient on androgen deprivation therapy, or ADT. It's only recently, however, with the availability of newer and superior therapies that the urology community has started to embrace treating this potential devastating complication. So Paul, let's, um, I've often thought of you really as one of the leaders in this. So tell us, because I know obviously Mark and many other groups across the country are thinking about starting and incorporating a bone health clinic really as a, as a takeoff point to almost a broader men's health clinic program. So if you had to advise groups and practitioners across the country, tell us a little bit about how, if you had to do this all over again, what first steps would you, would you take? How would you allocate resources, uh, uh, utilization of extenders? Uh, walk us down that path a little bit. Well, if I was to start over again, I probably wouldn't call it the bone health clinic. I'd call it the ADT clinic. So we started off focusing on bone health, but I think we relatively quickly morphed into saying, well, really, it's an ADT problem, and we're not fully assessing all the aspects of ADT besides bone health. We need to talk to the guys about cholesterol and diabetes and hypertension, which was ideally suited for the mid-level provider to take over and do that. So I would advise people not to call it a bone health clinic, but to say, I want an ADT clinic to start off with. So that was, that was the thing that I would say in retrospect I would start off with. And for us, we wanted to make the process easy. So I've talked to others. Um, I know Larry Karsh in Colorado talked about having in his EMR having a little checkbox, but you know a checkbox is somewhat onerous on each of your partners to have to deal with because that means they have to go out of their way to look for it. So we made it even simpler to say when you're on ADT, the mid-level provider will see you at some of your visits every time with your injection. So that enabled them to basically automatically see everybody who's receiving ADT to assess their bone health and assess other issues in terms of metabolic side effects of the disease. It also morphed further as we did more and more clinical trials and we looked at these advanced therapeutics to highlight or bring to the attending's attention that this guy's PSA has climbed or is rising at a faster rate or gee I, I got another one before your next visit to bring to the light hey we need to be watching these guys as the disease progresses more actively and also changed also from the standpoint of just monitoring their testosterone because I think we're all having a greater understanding that testosterone monitoring during treatment maybe is more paramount importance than monitoring testosterone only when they're failing treatment. So it was a whole series of events that led to everybody in ADT sees the mid-level provider at their visits. And it also economically changed too that we basically said we give ADT one designated day a week or now two designated days a week as we have 12 instead of seven. So economically we like the advantages of saying this is the day we do it, ordering was more efficient and although one would think the patients balked at giving them a specific date, well all the ADT therapies are really four week or 12 week or 24 week therapies so we made sure that we were more uniformly delivering our therapy and if they were going to miss a week, fine, we'll see you next Tuesday instead of this Tuesday and patient compliance was great and patient acceptance was great. I've had no pushback in terms of a more rigid scheduling for their treatment. It also left more freedom to the attending to basically not be there. Fine, they're due automatically for their treatment. We'll schedule you at the next time that you need necessary to see them. So you took this out of the hands of the practitioner, if you will, and just mandated that everybody within the practice, once ADT was instituted, they immediately flowed into your, bone, your, your ADT protocol. Correct. Okay. David, you talked about obviously the multidisciplinary approach for treatment now. So what about in the academic setting, how does this get incorporated? I know you and I talked offline early about the battle that potentially exists between urologists and it being almost a turf war with say endocrinology. Yeah. Well, you know, we're used to these turf wars. I can remember not too long ago we were battling radiology for ultrasound. Uh, when we first start doing with the old Crayman machine. And then, uh, the, 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 your, Paul's absolutely right. Uh, your statements were brilliant. I like your ADT concept. At first I heard that and went, what does that mean? But you're right, that's the direction we need to go because it's more all-encompassing. Um, and I think that the, one of the biggest challenges has been urologists even accepting that this is an issue. 
I mean, I remember when Fred Syed and Matt Smith came out with their publications and talked about SREs and everybody picked up and we don't see those. You hear that all the time. I never see those. Well, somebody's seeing them because they're out there. Um, and so the whole concept of trying to deal with this, uh, and, and we've done it. You know, I, you're right. It, I, even patients I have, I forget to put them on vitamin D and calcium, if that's valuable, or bisphosphonates, or now Exgiva and, and other, you know, uh, the, the Nasamera and other drugs that, that are out there. So um, it is an important thing. Um, we got in, I mean, we get into a little turf battle with, uh, with Endocrine about they have their own bone health clinic and uh, uh, supposedly do a better job than we do. Uh, we, have, we have issues even with the Nasamev injections uh, that you wouldn't have in private practice that, uh, that it's given in the infusion center and not in our office. So, but I think we all recognize it's an important issue and um, that it's uh, years ago it wasn't be, it, because when people went on ADT, they had advanced disease and their survival rate was two to three years. Now, if you look at ADT, most of it is not for advanced disease, and people live a long time, and they suffer all these things, the hot flashes, weight gain, loss of libido, osteoporosis, mental changes, and all the things that go along with it. Um, and I can tell you, one of the first things I'm going to do when I get back is I'm going to talk to our group about what you just said, an ADT uh, mid-level provider being involved, because uh, you're right, things won't fall through the cracks the way they do, even in our multidisciplinary clinic. Paul, I think you... You absolutely stated it correctly. I think this is a this is an area where we have created this issue. We have been giving we have been instituting androgen deprivation therapy for years. We've we've known about it. It's becoming more and more to the forefront, and I think we need to sort of take ownership uh, of these of these uh, complications that arise uh, from this treatment.